Oh, Ms. Holland, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to have this interview with you. Um, maybe as we start this, uh, this interview, Ms. Holland, can you maybe just briefly uh, tell me about yourself? Um, when were you born and uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? Okay. Um, by the way, yes. women have several titles that yeah. they should be called. Mm -hmm. mm. Anyway, I'm a hove, a fathered, nkomo, mothered. Uh, born at Wadi Love Mission where our father was a teacher trained in South Africa at Mpumelelo College which was a ecumenical Lutheran church supported um, institution coming from Berengwa. Okay. Yes, the Swedish Lutherans were the missionaries there. So we come out of that background. Why Wadi Love? Because that's where jobs a mission a, a propelled where. So the missionaries knew who came from where, okay. where teachers were needed. He was a teacher there. Okay. People like Dr. Sadza, uh, Nathan Shamiarira, Mrs. Shava, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mlanga, the first woman p permanent secretary. Those were all my father's students. Oh, okay. And always reminded us when they met us. Okay. Yes. So um, we moved from Wadi Love when my father got into the newspapers. He used to write a lot okay. to newspapers, mm -hmm. got offered a job uh, by the Paver brothers. And um, we moved to Mbare. Then we were the first residents of Highfields. Oh. There were three houses. In Highfields? Yes, and we were in the middle one. Okay. But we had arrived from Wadi Love mm -hmm. to Mbari. Okay. And that's where we actually lived. Our next door neighbor mm -hmm. was Hope Bakasa. Okay. Deborah Bakasa. Mm -hmm. She became Mrs. Dr. Sadza, my father's student. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, in Highfields, uh, my father then uh, got a promotion to start the Bantu Mira in the Bele speaking branch in Bulawayo. Okay. So we moved in December 1949 to be the residence at Old Luveve village, as it was called. At that time, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and um, at that time, our house in Bulawayo was like, um, it was a hub. Th there were people from all backgrounds who came to our house. Mm -hmm. I think you should check these things. Yeah. People like Albert Lutuli, people who were starting the African National Congress in, 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 in Northern Rhodesia, in Mozambique, in, they all met at our house. Okay. People like uh, um, Chitepo, Stanley Samkange, Dumbujena, those always were there and they were talking about politics mm -hmm. because the newspaper yes, had yeah. to have a proper perspective yes, yeah. of the proper headlines mm -hmm. uh, of what would be coming out the next day. Next day yeah. So we grew up in a house where the typewriter yeah. was just, the th yes, and the stories. Yeah. Now, with a combination of parents of Nkomo, and Hove, yeah. you can imagine there. I really feel very sad that um, Comrade Nkiwane was not interviewed before he passed away. Mm -hmm. Because we had a workshop um, which was run jointly by uh, NGOs which do peace building and security. Okay. And he called me aside mm -hmm. and he said, you know how Joshua Nkomo came to be prominent in these things? 
you, we, your father was approached by my father was approached by people who had come from Mashona land to say you come back to Salisbury because it's been at Wadi Love okay. and come and help us start this new uh, nationalist organization which we want to and my father said no 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 there is a brother-in-law of mine coming from Adams College okay. he will be a much better person he knows public relations He's very soft-spoken. He works with everybody. Okay. His name is Joshua Ngob. Okay. Come to the railways on Thursday. He says they met there. Uh -huh. And my father says, you he's, talk. Let's talk to you. Yes. Kiwana used to tell me that story. Wow. So the, the way we grew up was where our parents were really focused on getting people to understand one another's talent. My mom was a teacher mm -hmm. and uh, she just got tired in these parts in Mashona land of people, Mujiti, 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 Mujiti. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when they moved to Bulawayo, she really had a very active life there, okay. teaching. And um, she, would, she was a member of the National Council of Women as the president of that. People, people today don't know that in the 50s, there were teachers, women, young women, young women yeah. who were presidents of the National Council of Women. And uh, that had been a white organization. And they took that, okay. and the professional women took that over. And she joined up with a very brilliant young woman, Helen Vera Mangwende, Mrs. Mangwende, mm -hmm. who started the African Women's Clubs okay. in 1938 at the age of 18. After she graduated at St. Augustine's as a teacher, she was just really upset that her mom at Brayside Police, here in Salisbury, mm -hmm. was um, polishing the buttons of her husband's um, police clothes and starching them. And she just came from the rural areas without the actual know-how of what made these things. So she started at the age of 18, having graduated as a teacher, the African women's clubs under a tree in each a uh, what do you call places where police live camp in, um, yeah. Police camps, yeah right the Kuyeza clubs mm -hmm. if you ask them their history they don't know mm, they don't this know. is the history okay but then she married chief Mangwende, a very brilliant young man he had one arm and he's Ruoko and he gave the whites a very hard time mm -hmm. over the land. Okay. <laughs> but he had a very good eye for beauty, intelligence. He married Helen. He married, okay. <laughs> and he made her register the African women's clubs okay. to become a formal institution for development. Mm -hmm. So my mother teamed up with her. My mother was doing the radio home craft clubs. Every month, one day, our room, the girls' room, was vacated. Edward Moyo, a young man, mm -hmm. you know Edward Moyo became a PEMSEC. Mm -hmm. You know him? Yes, yeah. As a young man, John Manyarara, who became a judge, mm -hmm. as a young man, yeah. he, she had four of them mm -hmm. carrying all these radio things all, to record in our house, Ugubingelelana, which was the oh. African Women's Clubs oh, right. programs. It's still there today. Uh, on your, but that started with our mom okay. and her friends as the radio home craft clubs, and they exchanged recipes for sewing, for cooking. They did some wonderful things. And when you see me dressed like this, yeah. it's coming from the clubs. Okay, I don't know what topics or edworks or ed uh, we don't buy clothes from shops. Oh, we buy fabric. And the women's clubs make our clothes. Oh, up to now? Up to today. Wow, okay. <laughs> That's up to today. Okay. When I was home, my mother sold all my clothes. I never wore ready-made clothes. Okay. No, my sisters, we just had our... So, um, the story here is that Helen died when she was 35. She was accused of um, cooking the books because she was accused of stealing money from the women. The government took all her books. Okay. They audited them. When she died, they confessed that 
these were the best kept books of any organization wow. in the time. But they didn't tell her before she died. She died okay. With my mom, the white women were very upset that the African women were so well organized. Yeah. So they changed her constitution of the Radio Homecraft clubs and they expelled her. And uh, she was a driver. She had a car, my father's Chevrolet. And she, she said, before I go out of my organization, I'm going to sing you a song. Imbila, yaswela umsila, ngendaba, yogula yezela. And she said to these white women mm -hmm. in the 50s, you women are just like us women. When you go to the top to talk about what we've told you we want, you'll forget because you'll be talking about your own needs because you're as oppressed as we are by your own husbands. She said, let me tell you what this story is. Yeah. She said, God told all the animals to come and get a tail. And all the animals every day went. And on the last day, Lion said to Mbila, you, get off the sun. Let's go and get our tails. Mm -hmm. And Mbila said, ah, you get me the tail. The lion said, okay. When the lion got his tail, he was so fascinated about how beautiful it was. He forgot. Yeah. <laughs> so when he arrived there, Mbila said, where is my tail? Yours is so beautiful. He said, sorry, Mbila, I forgot. So my mother took her car and drove off. And she said, our daughters will never allow you to run our lives as African women in our own country. She left, but she was very hurt because her own clubs were now taken from her. Okay. Lady Treadgold became the new president of the Federation of African Women's Clubs. Okay. That's the story of the African woman. Yeah. Yeah, Excuse you, me. You, 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 <laughs> this story yeah. we have told Every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Vamu kabe kodi tired of it. Ah, ziamu kudaktara ni azi. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, Miss Holland, you're, you're talking about the liberated woman that we are thinking women got liberated a few years ago, but this is you're talking of uh, way way They're more liberated than us, okay. but they fused in us the spirit that when people are trying to defeat you, move away. Okay. Do what you never do. You know. okay. my, mother, my mother said, you shouldn't fight for three things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if somebody stinges you food, mm -hmm. go grow your own. Okay. If you are not hired in a job you've applied for, mm -hmm. start your own thing and hire people. Yeah. If your boyfriend jilts you, mind you, I never even thought I'd ever have a boyfriend. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are so many men and you have so many choices. Oh, yeah. Let him do what he wants to do. Okay. You'll find somebody. find somebody. So you always had this advice yeah. from the mother mm -hmm. that really empowered you. Yes. And you knew through life yeah. that um, your first choice of who you say you're going to be married to, mm -hmm. that was forever. So things of divorce, yeah. of you leave your husband, yeah. you... For us, <laughs> we think, ah, so it has say. It has say yes. Because that's your first choice. Yes, yeah. But that's fine. But okay. Miss Holly, let's talk about the political situation during these days. Mm -hmm. How was it, how were, was the relationship between blacks and whites during this time that you're talking about? Okay. My father uh, was one of the two members of parliament under the federation. I want to, you to understand the intricacies mm -hmm. of African politics. Okay. My father had no intention of getting into politics. Yeah. He had his three dictionaries okay. as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And he referred to all three when he was writing his articles. Okay. So, Simon Mzenda, mm -hmm. a fellow mm -hmm. yes, yeah. was <laughs> always at the house. Yeah. Masocha! My dictionary, you are missing something important. You always brought <laughs> to my father. Yes. So when Joshua Ngomo, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm jumping. There was a man called Ngabecha okay. who started something called the Mandebele and something. Okay. 
And uh, Mzenda says, ah, they're telling us that when we are here, we are shown us. But this is one country. So you were to go and stand in the Federation. And of course, the other person was Joshua Ngomo. Okay. Yeah. He said, but that's my brother-in-law. He said, ah-ah, uh -uh. let's show them. So my father's chauffeur and manager mm -hmm. of the campaign, the Federation, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say chauffeur. He, he was driving my father and also managing his campaign. Okay. It was Simon Mzenda. And so they traveled right through the Matebele land area up to Kwekwe. You know, he represented it. It was called Gwai South. Okay. <laughs> it was the whole of Matebele land and Midlands. Okay. And Jasper Savanu was Mashona land, Mashingo, all those. Mm -hmm. So my father won the election. Who was the first person to come and congratulate him, his brother-in-law? Oh, okay. Joshua Nkwenyana. Yeah, he said, ah, Nkwenyana, Tata. Okay. They were very close. Mm -hmm. When Zapu started something called G. Yes, G, yes, I know. 3,000 people came to our house. They ran away from the townships. We didn't understand what it was about. But all the business community brought food, drinks, blankets, and I think they stayed with us like a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. But again, my father never said to us, oh, Zapu is bad. He just said, violence is bad. bad. Okay. And you can never win anything with violence. Okay. So those lessons to us mm -hmm. were so clear as we grew up. Jairus okay. uh, Jiri was always there as well carrying a person with disability yeah. wherever he went and this Malu, Malinga who is there now and Piri, yes, yeah. Alexander Piri, yes, uh -huh. those were like at that time the two that he was most concerned about. My father said, listen, you must register this thing. You were gyros. Okay. Register some. So they registered the place in Bulawayo. Okay. The Jairus Jiri Center. Center yes, yeah. And there, people with disability were taught how to look after themselves. Okay. They believed that Hakuna Muna Snabasa, our parents. Yeah. And they always met every Friday at different homes like Josiah uh, Gumede, Osiwela. You wouldn't know these eminent, eminent uh, yeah. people who built Bulawayo. Okay. Uh, died too early, man. We were invited. Sometimes Zan wakes up and they think of some positive things to do. Sometimes. Then they go to sleep <laughs> and they destroy what they have done. You must put this in. <laughs> <laughs> so when they saw the light, yeah. we were invited to say, now we want to work with NGOs okay. and you must come and work with us on Unity Day. So... Unity Day 2019, we were invited and we went to Drill Hall. I'd never been in a uh, Zanu PF place. And my husband said, Are we at the right place? I said, It's so filthy. I remember Drill Hall is the place where the colored people, oh, in my time, yeah, during that, yeah. we never even went there because we didn't dance. You know, they, Now, this Zanu PF had taken it and it was really bad. Okay. And it's Kosana said to the audience, we are welcoming the daughter of M. M. Ove, the young men of Bulawayo, when we were kids, who built this. People in Drill Hall didn't even understand what Skosana was talking about, because we, we are not proud of where we have been, okay. Zimbabweans. And the young are not curious mm -hmm. to even understand where did we come from yeah, with but, this thing? But, but in your case, is it not the case that um, you have also built a, a, a solid name um, uh, uh, for yourself, such that uh, when someone say, says Hove, someone will say, no, no, we know as this is Mr. Kai Holland. You have this, you have this uh, good name, a good uh, reputation that you have. You have built a good name for yourself. No, so I haven't <laughs> actually. I think the Australians have. Oh, okay. Because... Uh, then, of course, um, my father was on the UZ Council with the rest of Rhodesia and mm -hmm. The Queen Mother came to open it. 
and the Vana Helen Vera, Mangwendi, Vana Mai, sewed ball gowns for themselves. Okay. And okay. they wore ball gowns. Yeah. And they had their hair. Ah! <laughs> yes. About the Chalang. Anyway, uh, they met the Queen Mother. Mm -hmm. They baked the scones. They did all that. Mm -hmm. And the Queen Mother invited Helen Vera, Mangwende, Mrs. Mangwende, Sarah Chavunduka from UZ, and my mom okay. to come to the UK. You know, we have different ways of accepting invitations. Sarah Chavunduka and my Mangwende went as visitors of the Queen Mother yes. to London. Yes. But my mother said, uh uh, I want to come to the United Kingdom to learn home craft and okay. improve my home craft skill. So she spent a year with her best friend, Mrs. Musa, at um, Reading Home Craft College. Okay. And uh, they came back to tell us that, hey, we are being living, a, we are living a lie here. Okay. You can be as fat as you want. There are lots of fat people there. <laughs> this thing of slimming, eh? <laughs> <laughs> they, brought, they brought, they uh, brought, this is the 50s. Yeah. This is the 50s. So, um, I'm saying to you, I haven't built a name for myself. So, I know for myself that I don't want to go to UZ as I was now doing my secondary school. I knew I didn't want to go to the UK. I wanted to go where no Zimbabwean had put their foot down because the politics here was so bad. Um, because of my father's politics, which nobody ever asked him, so when we walked into a room, people would say, chombe, chombe. But you know, our what parents sell out. Okay. Our parents had brainwashed us so much that you were told, can our pindam class? Okay. And the Iwewe, Inko Ziva Kuti. Baba Pana Chavari Kutengesa. What are we selling here? <laughs> what are we selling? So, what was the philosophy of Jasper Savanu and Masocha over in Parliament? They truly believed that the game of numbers in the end was going to win in the long run. So as many Africans, as opportunities opened, must go in and see what is it that they are doing. Okay. And they went in without any um, excuse or whatever. It's the, my father's um, uh, initiatives which built Mpilo and Gomo. And which put this new teacher training thing called NPH. Go and check in the parliamentary things. Okay. Go and check that for yourself. But they are the ones who actually made the bringing in of Africans mm. with the means into the mainstream possible. Because they knew and understood the connection within African families. Up to today, I remember when I first came with my husband and he met my father's only sister. She was a teacher in Beringo, very famous teacher, mm -hmm. Miss Ove. And she was wearing tennis shoes, the waiting car to, ja to jump and jive, uh, not jive, but they were doing the traditional dance of welcoming Mkwasha. Okay, yes, yeah. And the whole lot, oh, why is she wearing tennis shoes? Shouldn't we be buying sh leather shoes for her? Mm. They got to wait until you see what they are going to do. When they did the traditional dance of welcoming him, yeah. he saw the point. He understood that. Right, but I'm saying, um, then the... I, I want to put it so that you understand it and you're not lost. Mm -hmm. I knew I didn't want to go to UZ. I knew I didn't want to go to the north. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go somewhere else. Okay. So I went to do my form 5 and 6 in Chipembe Girls School okay. in northern Rhodesia okay. during the Federation. Mm -hmm. And um, there, we were involved with the Kaundas uh, coming into power. You know, mm -hmm. we finished our form 6 in 1963, oh, and Zambia became, became independent, independent in 1964, Four, the following six. year. Yeah. But all form 6 students under the Federation in northern Rhodesia and Yasaland were sent overseas. Okay. And I had internal knowledge 
because my father was the junior minister of education and then the ambassador mm -hmm. of Rhodesia in Yasaland in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So we had access to information on what was happening. Yes. So I knew if I went to Zambia, I would be going where I want. And I chose Australia okay. because I just wanted to be as far away as possible from what had really been a very bad situation, very toxic. So whenever people were now... Uh, I don't know what the Shona word is. Mm -hmm. Chombe, chombe. I just know. Surely I don't want to marry you when you're so disrespectful. Okay. Surely you're so small. How do you attack a little girl when you know that you should be talking to... My father was six foot five. So they would never say that to him. Oh, okay. He would arrive there. All the whites would run away. And all the, yeah, he was a kid. Mr. Hove was a phenomenon. <laughs> so... Um, the desire to get away was very strong okay. when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So when we got to, um, um, when I got to win the scholarship, mm -hmm. my, I didn't tell my parents because they thought I was going to, go, going to London School Economics to stay with Dr. Walter Adams and his family. Okay. Because here at your University of Rhodesia, yes, I was staying with them. They had a daughter the same age as me, oh, Natasha. Okay. Right. And uh, so I just knew I didn't want to be going to stay with anybody there. Okay. I wanted to cut my own ground, right? So I say to my parents at Christmas, I'm going to Australia on the 28th of January. This is, how are you going to get this? I've got a scholarship. <laughs> It was a very generous scholarship. Six years, arts law, and um, they were so surprised. A child would write to say, I want to come there. Mm -hmm. I was just given that. So surely 20th comes, and I flew to Australia, and I arrived on Australia Day, 26th of January. Oh, okay. So every Australia Day is my departure. <laughs> and, and yeah, so... I arrived there on Australia Day in 1964. Okay. And uh, for me, that was my liberation day. So, you know, Zimbabweans today, wherever we go, mm -hmm. we have a certain innocence, which is so, it's, it's, our, it's our strength. Yeah. Yeah. I was so silly. Okay. I don't even want to think <laughs> <laughs> what people thought yeah. when I was expressing myself. Okay. Like on things like racism and that, I didn't see it until I said, but where are blacks? Yeah. And the answers I was given were not satisfying. Mm. What did and they say? Ah, Rekupi, they had never been asked that. And they thought, I thought it was a privilege for me to be there as a black person among all those whites. But I just wanted black people around me, the indigenous ones. Uh, Ms. Hollett, when you say when you left, mm -hmm. when you went to Australia, mm -hmm. that was your sort of like, like your liberation. What do you mean? Because there was nobody there who had a background of the politics I had come out of to be calling me Chombe. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and to be seeing me and saying, oh, 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 and it's it. Oh, okay. Yeah, because for me, the, the strength I had was that group of people who built Bulawayo, mm -hmm. the people my father had come from, Nathan Shamiarira and those um, in Wadi Love, and the people that I had been with them, Bandeni Mission, where I did all my primary, okay. the Catholics there, those were family to me because never at any point did they actually say anything to me negative okay. about my father's politics. Okay. Yes. I just had a very strong sense that there was something missing in people who would call a little girl a sellout. So today, I actually want to write a book on what sellout means to those who use that word. Okay. For me, it's a meaningless word. Okay. What are you selling? <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you are supposed to be selling? Mm -hmm. Because it's just a word... Like one. many things Zimbabweans say to put each other down instead of building one another. Mm -hmm. Because your strength comes from the next person. Yeah, networking, yeah. It does not come from you then telling other people how bad they are. Okay. Yeah, but when you put other people down, you're putting yourself down. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
But w w why were these people calling your father a seller? Because the people who were in the Federation mm -hmm. were seen as anti-nationalist. Oh, okay. It was a very, you know, um, you should never separate the issue of racism as different in different parts of situations. My father won something which they are doing these days. It's called the U.S. leadership. It's a visit to the United States. Oh, okay, yeah. And he went, I think, six weeks. Okay. When he came back, Emmett Tyrrell had been lynched the year before. And he brought us the most horrific stories about racism in the United States. And uh, he brought us the um, different singers, you know, they were the classical singers. Something called the twist had just been introduced uh, at that time. They all these different, uh, very big talents in the United States were covered in this really bad phenomenon of racism. Mm -hmm. And my father had actually tried to meet Martin Luther King, but he met the father of Martin Luther King because he followed him thinking he had gone to visit his father and they, they had a wonderful afternoon, afternoon tea. And what my father brought to us was Martin Luther King's <laughs> lawyer is 24, 23. <laughs> what can he do in such a vicious system? Mm -hmm. But our father thought that in Africa, we needed to understand the phenomenon of racism in the United States because it would help us here to have a united front, not just for ourselves, but in the region, but in Africa, but also internationally. Okay. And his feeling was that if you didn't have that network like that, mm -hmm. in fact, our struggle to liberation would take much longer. Because my father said, because of numbers, there was no way in which Europe was going to win anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He never saw them winning a thing. And I used to say to my father, but how? I didn't understand population. And uh, he did. So he never saw violence as something that would yield anything. But he said, Fundani, they seem to have done some things better than us. But Havana, who know? And they have to have Wunu to succeed with what they are doing. This was being told to us as kids. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, when you went to Australia... Right. Um, the Australians realized they really had to protect me. <laughs> I still have family in Australia. Before I met my husband, and when I met my husband, on the first day at university in class, mm -hmm. in 1965, in March, we never parted till today. He's still at the house. Um, and wants to live in Zimbabwe, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's a terrible thing because here yeah, I'm a prisoner. I want to be in my house in Sydney with my grandchildren. <laughs> anyway, that's by the by. Okay. I'm saying, so Australians just responded to my naivety okay. and innocence okay. and just built around me a protective layer where I could really excel by doing what I really wanted to do, okay. which was to really explain to them how could they help consolidate the mechanisms for the liberation of Africans by themselves. Okay. So day one, that's what they understood was what my desire was. Mm -hmm. So all these awards I have from Australia mm -hmm. come from institutions which were very much related to what we did. And uh, as students, we did some things which today, I think, so why are students here not understanding they could do these non-violent things okay. and achieve more? Okay. Yeah. W which are some of these things that you're talking about? Right. right. Um, there was in Australia a South African embassy which preached the most incredible racist things. And it was very popular with Australians because, of course, you travel cheaply to southern Rhodesia, you travel cheaply to South Africa. 
one of the students from our hall, Bill Gamage, went and had a demonstration on his own, saying we should stop sporting ties with South Africa. And I asked Bill, why, why are you saying that? And he said, are you aware that all the teams from South Africa are selected on racial criteria? We don't want them here. Because in America, if you look, the best sports people are black. So why do these whites want to lie to the world? This was a white person, okay. Bill Gamage. So he really made me understand a thing that I had not understood. And uh, I was in my first year at university. And so at that time, this would be 1965, 66, among Australians, they started, the young people started to understand that what was happening in South Africa and in Rhodesia was very wrong. And they started organizing. And of course, they called us to be the face of that. Yes. For me, that was not good enough. I thought, now, where are the Aborigines in all this? How do we in other people's land do our own fight. Yeah. So we looked for them. So one day I was walking in Sydney and this beautiful black woman was walking with another black woman, very beautiful. And then this white man carrying their bags. And I dragged them, I said, who are you? I'm Sekai Hove, I'm from, no, I was now Holland. I'm Sekai Holland, I'm from Zimbabwe. They took me to their office, it was called Fakati. And she was in, they were islanders. Okay. And uh, this, the, the, the one was an islander, one was an aboriginal. Okay. Faith Bangla and Dulce Flower became my best friends. And they became my eyes into the aboriginal community. And they introduced me to the whole plethora of what I had been looking for since I arrived in Australia. Okay. There was a place called Redfern where the young younger than me, uh, were organizing politically. Okay. And uh, that's how we then just got into the whole mix of things with organizing against the Australians playing sports with South Africa. Right. What did we do? Um, I'll just hone in on the final victory one. Yes. Um, the unions the students, the faith-based, the Australian Council of Churches, like the Zimbabwe Council of Churches, yeah. if we understood the importance of the World Council of Churches, we would be so embracing of the Zimbabwe Council of Churches. Okay. Because at the forefront of the struggle against apartheid was the World Council of Churches. And the Australian Council of Churches and the different people here in Rhodesia who had the faith-based approach, were linked to that. There was a department uh, called the uh, department against, the World Council of Churches Department Against Racism. It coordinated all the anti-apartheid movement groups okay. into its own department to see what they could do in terms of policy changes, support. So they came to Australia to work with us on getting the Aboriginal groups linked to the department. Okay. And Brigelia Bam, who became the ZEC mm -hmm. director in South Africa, okay. she was a young social worker who got a job in the World Council of Churches in the section against racism with someone called Spies, Spivey. They traveled around the world getting all these properly institutionalized and so very young as students we got linked to the Americas through the African Stockley Carmichael Black is beautiful he married uh, Miriam Makeba um, we, we got linked into a whole lot you know when the Black Panthers were doing their thing they came a branch in Australia of the Black Panther anyway what did we do on Zimbabwe mm. but before before that mm. Miss Holland you have this this sharp memory, you remember names, you remember places, and so on. Mm. This, this sharp memory, 
our generation don't have that sharp memory. You don't want to have it. <laughs> but let me say this now. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, in this whole way we were organizing, mm -hmm. a young, young boy in London called Peter Hain, who was born in Kenya, became a South African citizen, mm -hmm. and eventually left for the UK. They started something called sports, uh, you know, it's no sporting ties with apartheid. Mm -hmm. So we invited him to Australia. Okay. And what we did there was to ensure that we upset all the sporting events. If you go back, there is a film called um, Political Football. Can you put that down? Political. You won't recognize me. I don't recognize myself in the film. I'm so young. Um, we organized to totally disrupt the whole uh, tournament. So the unions mm -hmm. found out where the spring box were going to be hoteled. Okay. And you know the rules in South, the laws in South Africa forbade black and white marriages. And so you couldn't they couldn't stay in a hotel where there was a mixed couple. So we were booked there by the unions. So when we arrived, the hotel was shocked. They had booked us in there with the spring box. And the spring box had paid a huge sum of money. So Holland walked there and he says, what are you saying? They say, no, you can't sleep here for four nights. We have, the, the hotel is full. He says, no, we booked four weeks ago. This is our room. And they were shocked. Yeah. <laughs> so we were given the worst room, which was on a balcony facing the ground, exactly what we wanted. So we had something like 10,000 young students from all over Australia shouting all night, go home, spring box. Pox on the box, it's the syphilis on the... Um. Okay. It was bad <laughs> the whole night. Yeah. And uh, we were standing on the balcony waving. All night. All night. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, when they were playing, we were asleep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't play because they were, we were tired. tired. Yes, yeah. But we went to the grounds. They put a pig with oil. And we were a married couple. Carried the cot into the grounds. Let the pig into the ground. <laughs> when the match started. And then all the demonstrators ran onto the ground with whistles. <laughs> anyway but where were you getting all these guns well students were students listen to the west one <laughs> there was a Rhodesia was information a center <laughs> and these young people got Jim and I to get into the car Jim never told me what they had organized okay. we went to the Rhodesia information center and they all walked in these white kids I didn't know what they were doing there but they said, we want to migrate to Rhodesia. And these silly, silly workers believe that 15, 30 Australian students would want to migrate to Rhodesia. So they gave them these forms to fill out. When they were stamped and they had paid, they locked the workers in the toilets, their own toilets. And they took all the documentation, everything. And uh, we went and had a press conference to say, we've taken over the Rhodesia Information Center. It's now called the Free Zimbabwe Center. And the director is Sekai Holland. And we are at number 98 Ruthven Street, our house. Our spare bedroom became... We went to the Supreme Court. We said the sanctions don't allow Australia, Portugal, the United States to have a Rhodesia Information Center. It's against sanctions. We lost the case. But soon after that... Um, all the Rhodesia information centers were closed in Sydney, in Portugal, and in New York because of our action. So we were never arrested or charged. Okay. But the guts for people to lock workers, yeah. into, there were no cell phones. <laughs> yeah. There were no cell phones. They dismembered the phones, allowed them out, so they couldn't. But we rang uh, London, Buckingham Palace to say we've taken over the Rhodesia Information Centre, the new director. We rang the Australian Prime Minister, Gough Wicklam, and told him we'd taken over the... They didn't know what to do. Yeah. 
because there were sanctions saying this could not be done and the governments were breaking the law. Okay. So what I'm saying is what beats me in Zimbabwe with students mm -hmm. is that they do not have positive perceptions of how you deal with what you do not want. Because fighting people who are in power before you have a strategy, you will always lose. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We did a lot of things, mm -hmm. a lot of things. Mm -hmm. When now, for the first time in 26 years, Labour Party won. Mm -hmm. Gough Wickham's first visitor to Australia was Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. Okay. So again, as students, there was not a day when Gough Wickham said, we recognize the liberation movements. But when he won the elections in 1972, mm -hmm. 50 years ago this year, mm -hmm. his first announcement at his town hall was, we stop all stop sporting ties with South Africa. This is 1972, mm -hmm. until democracy comes to South Africa. There was no sporting tie between Australia and South Africa until 1995, when Mandela okay. wore the jersey yes. and went to Australia. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's us who stopped that. Wow. So, um, but, 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 wait, let's, let's uh, go back a bit. Um, you know, Sekai Hall has become Sekai Holland here. How have you met um, Jim? Oh, yes. On the first day at university, walked in this. First day? Yeah. At university, March 1965, he walks into the class, looks around, sees me, comes straight to me. Where are you from? I say, I'm from Bulawayo. I always used to say that. <laughs> she says, that's not a country. She said, Southern Rhodesia. She says, no, 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 there's nothing like that. You're from Zimbabwe. I said, no. Zimbabwe, we've got ruins in Fort Victoria. He says, ah. <laughs> he was the son of a diplomat. And the children of diplomats actually learn the facts oh, yes. in the schools they go. In those days, mm -hmm. I don't know the schools where diplomats send their children today. No. Yeah. Yeah. But those kids were very, and we had a whole stack of high life records mm -hmm. because it just come from Nigeria oh, okay. and it just come from Ghana mm -hmm. where his father had been the charge starting new Australian embassies. Oh, okay. And he'd been to Cairo. He'd been to, um, as the son of a diplomat. Yeah, yes, yeah he yes. never stayed um, in Australia uh, since the time he was three. And he was educated in the UK, in Winchester. Oh, okay. You know, one of the top three uh, colleges where the elites send their kids. Mm -hmm. But the important thing there about the meeting at that time mm -hmm. was that my father had been in Nigeria at the same time as his father. But we had never met. Oh, okay. Yes. And um, he was really surprised by the coincidence. Okay. And so he offered to teach me, to, to, to help me with the political science uh, lessons. Okay. And I thought, God, I've got Cambridge, you know. I did Form 6. Yeah. So um, after two weeks, I didn't understand a word. I was looking for him. I couldn't find him. <laughs> When he walked in, I jumped and I said, you know, I don't understand anything. He said, oh, don't you? Okay. I was in the student Christian movement. He joined there. Okay. He's an atheist. He didn't tell me he was an atheist. Oh, okay. And he knew about the Bible. He knew everything. And we all thought, gee, what a clever guy. And so he was gunning to see that we were... <laughs> anyway... We eventually got married. No, 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 I knew I didn't want to go to London. Mm -hmm. I knew I was going to be married at 25 because I had calculated my studies and then, really that's a fact. Okay. So when he started saying he liked me, I said, how old are you? 18. I said, oh, come back when you're 21. I was really arrogant about it. Okay. When he was 21, he came back, he says, now, can we get married? 
but my own situation with my own chosen one had been actually thrown in the dustbin. And oh. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> and I had been heartbroken. <laughs> so, so you came at the right time? No! I can't go back. <laughs> he was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> he was hoping this would happen. Ah, all of them were hoping. So it happened then. So. Okay. But uh, I mean, what's so nice? You married where? Which year did you get? 1968. 1968. On his father's birthday. Okay. Because I was now saying I'm going back home. And uh, uh, when we got our scholarships, we signed that we would go back home. Oh, okay. And I really now wanted to go back home. Yeah. And uh, he said, oh, let's get married. We did. But I came first home. Okay. African women my age, you don't get married. I came home mm -hmm. to tell my parents this is what now I was going to do. And my parents were heartbroken. I but um, then what they didn't know was that I said to my husband, is a condition for our getting married that we would live in Zimbabwe. Okay. A, a, a condition I regret. <laughs> <laughs> because he remembers it oh, every when, time. Whenever I want to go back to Australia, I say, you are the one who... He <laughs> says, we are here fulfilling your wish. <laughs> <laughs> But when uh, we uh, got married, we, you know, um, he, he, was, he just finished his degree in Mandarin. The children of diplomats were very aware of the importance of China. And so he okay. was doing a degree called Asian, BA Asian Studies and oh. learning Chinese. And guess what? They were learning to write. Mm -hmm. Long live Mao. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and so um, I said to him, Chinese is not going to be useful in Zimbabwe. So we moved to Sydney for him to do engineering. Okay. And he just really did brilliantly. Okay. And um, the brilliant science students went to a place called Elizabeth, like NASA. Oh, okay. And uh, he went there, and he nearly drowned, actually. And oh. he says, he thought, ha, leaving my wife for other people. <laughs> so we moved oh, okay. back to Sydney okay. and uh, really worked towards coming home. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we knew mm -hmm. in coming home, we had to have done a lot of work okay. of supporting okay. the liberation movement. Oh, okay. yes. Yes, yes. So now Nyerere then, mm -hmm. Malimu, yeah. is invited in 1973. Mm -hmm. And uh, he comes with a delegation of 18. I will never forget that. We went to the airport mm -hmm. with a huge banner. Welcome to Australasia, Malimu Julius Nyerere, champion of the liberation movement. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom we had, what about you, Goff? Goff Wicklam. Okay. <laughs> Are you supporting the liberation of this? <laughs> anyway, he was just embarrassed mm -hmm. that there was an African woman dressed in African dress and this white boy everywhere he went carrying that banner yeah. with all the other students in between. And so we were invited in the evening by the foreign minister to see whether we would organize a tour for Chairman Chitepo. And uh, my husband said, ah, it will backfire. You must at first invite somebody who is a moderate. Okay. We knew that in Boston was a, um, a very brilliant, articulate spokesperson of both the ZAPU and ZANU mm -hmm. coalition, which had done the PS commission, Edison Zwobo. Yes, yes. So we said, invite him mm -hmm. to come here for eight weeks. He'll do the six Australian states, do Papua New Guinea, and then do New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk about the moderate view. Okay. And he did. Mm -hmm. No, but I'm cutting it. Uh, we did not see the seriousness of that conversation with a foreign minister. Yeah. 
We are students. Oh. And we were thinking about what we had done running in the field. We were still doing the things of Zokutambari. <laughs> things we can invite to table. Who are we? Yeah. So they said, so how long would you prepare to receive Edison's hobo? Holland looked at me and said, how long? I said, mm, three weeks. We didn't know how serious this was. Yeah. And how long after that? We said, two weeks after the eight weeks, Chitepo can come. Because Australians are so racist, but they are also people who believe in fairness. Oh, okay. And the saying in Australia of please be fair is fair go, mate. Oh, okay. When somebody's doing something wrong to you, mm -hmm. you just say, fair go. Fair go. Give fair me a go. chance. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we uh, said they will be so upset with Edison wanting to negotiate with people who are arresting them and beating them up and doing all that. They'll be ready to hear the yeah. information that there's an armed struggle Start going on, on yes. and they'll support it. Mm -hmm. So the Tanzanians left with a deal, but we forgot. Two weeks after they left, yeah. we got a letter, of, a telefax from the office of the president in Tanzania. Yeah. Mr. Zwobo is ready to come. I flew to Melbourne <laughs> where the Australian Union of Students offices were. Yeah. And I just say to them, you, we just committed a big crime. <laughs> we need a ticket from Boston to Sydney around the country and back over eight weeks. They did that. We were members of the Australian Union of Students. Okay. Okay. And then we said we need the uh, two posters, we need banners, we need they did all that. Oh. Exactly the day we said Edison would arrive, we all were at the airport welcoming him. Wow. And um, he was shocked mm -hmm. to find all of us there with his name, his face, mm -hmm. in Australia. Yeah. But he didn't know. It was a, a, a job to be done. The first meeting was at Sydney Town Hall. Oh. And um, there... Um, the hall was packed. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of advertising. Okay. And the sitting in the front row was a nun. We were shocked. And Edison is very dramatic. He started by teaching us how to pronounce his name. The whole hall! Zvobka! Typical of him, yeah. Typical so, of him. <laughs> he was staying with us. Okay. So we would tell him what to expect. We lived in a squat. You know what a squat is? No. It's a place that was uh, given to the Anglican Church for 99 years. Okay. And they were just about to sell it off and students could go and rent. Oh, okay. Okay. So all the students lived there. It's a very Bondi Junction. Okay. Anyway. Um, so Bokem. Sobo in the town hall is teaching people how to pronounce his name. He doesn't know. These people want to know what's going on. So he talks about... Edison was very clear about how bad things were. Okay. So the nun asks, what is the solution? He says, dialogue. The whole hall yeah. just got really upset with Zobo. Yeah. And the nun jumped up. I can't ever forget that. And through... Australian dollars at him and said, I've got $34, which I brought here with me. Go buy yourself a gun and fight with the other men. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we had hoped for. So he met the, the, the only black uh, governor in South Australia, invited him after seeing that terrible thing. Yeah. And he really wanted to hear for himself. For himself, but, yeah. And he, we, we, he didn't realize that was not wanted by anybody. So he repeated the same thing. <laughs> and the governor said, Mr. Zobo, go back home. Join the other people who are fighting. Yeah. Fight Smith. Yeah. And Zobo was shocked. No tea, nothing left. Everywhere he went. Mm -hmm. That was what happened. So, so, so the so mood out there. Fair go. Give everybody a chance. Chance. Okay. So when he left, two weeks later, we welcomed the chairman. Yeah. And of course, everybody was ready to hear yeah. that there are people willing to fight. To fight, yes. And they wanted to know how do we support you. Yes. I'll send you the tape. 
-huh. in his uh, uh, meeting with the uh, press club okay. in Canberra. I'll send you that. Oh, okay. But it's wrong that it was the press club. This was done at La Trobe University oh, okay. in um, o o Monash. It was the Victoria. Mm -hmm. I was still doing film and television. I was still studying. Oh, okay. So I always used to have a camera. And we always used to tape all events. Events. The only speech, your chairman, Iripo, is from Australia. Oh. That's the one quoted by everyone. Oh, okay. It's from me. Okay. So, um, Ikoko, there was a young man at Monash University, Simbarashe mm Mbegegui. -hmm. Okay. So I would always ring Simba. He was a zeal out here, Zanu. Mm -hmm. Before we even thought Zanu could be supported because we were supporting all liberation movements. Okay, yeah. But Simba would always say, ah, Zanu, do you know it? And we would all be looking at him, thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so when Zopo came, he was our front person. When Chitepo came, we invited him to travel with Chitepo okay. on our behalf. Mm -hmm. This was the Free Zimbabwe Center doing this. Okay in the Southern Africa Liberation Center in Sydney. in Sydney. It's still there today. It's now called the Zimbabwe Information Center. Oh, okay. And uh, so um, we <coughs> had an extremely successful tour of the chairman. Mm -hmm. ZANU was uh, registered, was in all Western countries mm -hmm. said to be a terrorist organization. Okay. But as a result of that visit mm -hmm. to Australia, a Commonwealth country, yeah. India saw him in all the TVs he did. They invited him to Delhi and uh, really did understand yeah. that oh, this man is the chairman of all the liberation movements by election. But he's from an organization we are told is a terrorist a organization. Terrorist yeah. So our visit, our trip mm -hmm. was done in such a way as to get things ironed out in the Commonwealth, but in the, under the radar in Australia. Okay. That was the role we played. 